Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Yvette from the CRA. Thank you for calling in this morning. We know it's an extremely difficult time right now, and we appreciate all of you being here. Um, we also appreciate all of the hard work, dedication, and generosity we've seen from each of you. Um, just another example of what makes our industry so great, and it's this passion that continues to fuel us here at the CRA. Uh, we know there's still a lot of confusion out there, and so we wanted to host this call this morning to cover some of the most common questions that we've received, along with some of the important information we have in regards to federal and state support. Before we jump in, I um, just want to go over some housekeeping rules. We have everybody on mute right now, um, as there's a lot of us on the call. Um, I'm finding some people are unmuting themselves, so please just make sure you stay muted so we don't have that background noise. We're going to try to control this on our administrative side, but if you can, just keep your um, phones muted, and if you're on your computer, just keep your uh, com computer microphone muted as well. Um, so you know you don't have to have your camera on. Um, you can also um, have your turn your camera off so people can't see you if, if you choose. Um, also, as far as housekeeping rules, you can um, submit questions using the chat feature, which is in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Um, if you're on your computer, you just select that chat function. Um, we're going to be trying to answer questions um, throughout the presentation regardless, but any questions that we don't answer in our presentation, we'll, we'll save to the end and get all of your questions answered. Um, if you are on your phone um, or can't access the chat feature, you can also email your questions to us. That email is info at ctrestaurant.org. Again, that's info at ctrestaurant.org. We also want to remind everyone of our various information channels. So at this time, um, Jennifer from the CRA will share uh, her screen so that you can see what some of these um, info sites look like. Uh, so you know, we have been sending regular alerts and updates by email, and we're going to continue to do that, but we're, we're finding that spam filters are now blocking keywords related to coronavirus. Uh, so please make sure to bookmark and follow our other info sites. Um, we have the first one that you see here is our dedicated info site in Facebook groups called CT Restaurants Collaborative. You can search for it in Facebook groups or you can go directly there at, uh, from facebook.com backslash groups backslash CT Restaurants. And um, we ask that you follow this group so that you can get our alerts as the information comes in. If you're not on Facebook, our website has a comprehensive list of updates, information, and resources, as you can see on your screen. You can find that at ctrestaurant.org. Um, that's right on our homepage. You'll find everything right there. And as I mentioned, since we know that emails aren't being received because of spam, we also have linked all of our emails to our website. You can see, you can select from the pull down at the top of our screen or you can go there directly to ctrestaurant.org backslash emails. And this is where you'll get uh, links to all of the emails that we've been sending out and email updates in case you haven't received them. Um, then of course, uh, you can follow our regular Facebook and Instagram accounts for the Connecticut Restaurant Association as well. So I know that was a lot. We just wanted to make sure that you know where to find information and resources as they come in or as you need it. Uh, but with that, I wanted to turn things over to our webinar speakers today, um, and we'll show you who will be speaking today on our screen in just a second. So um, we have with us today uh, Scott Dolch, the Executive Director of the Connecticut Restaurant Association. We've got Ryan O'Donnell our CRA legal counsel from Siegel, O'Connor, O'Donnell and Beck. And we have Nicole Griffin, our CRA contract lobbyist with Powers, Griffin and Hill. So at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Scott Dolch. And Scott, you'll just need to come off Thanks. mute. There Thanks you are. Hey, Thank you. Good, mor good morning, everybody. Um, I appreciate first and foremost, you guys getting on a call here on a uh, Sunday morning. Um, it's uh, um, obviously a, a tough time and a challenge for for what you guys are are going through and dealing with. Um, and you know, I just want you guys to know that we, as an association, are here here for you guys as much as we can be. Um, hold on one second, guys. Hold on. 
really care. So one of the um, pleasures of working from home and working remotely, as most of you know, Scott has a family, <laughs> young children, and a new puppy, as I'm sure many of you are dealing with balancing, um, you know, what we have going on and balancing your businesses and maintaining balance with your family. So we'll just hang on just a moment for Scott to come back. Is everybody still there? I apologize. Um, I have a, a, a two-year-old um, that was just screaming, so I want to make sure I didn't have that in the background. So. Can everybody still hear me? About can you still hear me? Yes, Scott, loud and clear. Sorry. Okay. All right. So obviously, trying to do this for the first time. So guys, I just today's call and why I try to put it together. I know I've had some smaller group calls with um, my board um, over the last uh, couple days here, and um, just trying to keep everybody as up to date as we can. I thought that this would be um, another step for trying to get more of you guys um, in the loop of kind of as an association, what we're working on, um, what has been going on over the last six or seven days, um, and what we should be looking, what we're looking at in, in front of us, and what we're kind of working on as, as Nicole and Ryan will chime in as well as we go through. So I know you guys got a chance to have Yvette go through all of our resources. Um, we are trying to expand on those as we go forward every single day. Um, obviously, this is another example of trying to do a webinar um, to at least provide you guys the most up-to-date information. We'll try to answer as many questions that we can. Um, so without further ado, I guess we'll just kind of quickly go through um, what we've seen in the last, I guess, almost six days. So uh, first and foremost, um, on Monday, March 16th, the, the governor um, provided the executive order for Connecticut to close all uh, closure of, of on-premise dining. Um, you guys all know that, um, know how that's kind of affected, especially our full service restaurants, um, the hardest and what that has done for, you know, as we talk to our state legislators, um, you know, we, we know, you know, I think there was over 60,000 people that have, that have filed for unemployment in the last four days because of this. And, and we are at the front lines of, of, as an industry dealing with, with these decisions, obviously we know at the end of the day, it is about public health and safety, but um, we'll get into here a little bit later about the things we're hoping to recoup for not only the employers, but the employees of what we're working through. So that was obviously on Monday. Um, on Thursday, with the work of, of Nicole Griffin, our contract lobbyist, um, we had seen what was going on around other states um, with their their uh, you know delivery, uh, not obviously having the alcohol, but the takeout, the curbside, and the drive-through piece of alcohol sales. So we worked hard um, with our legislators and head of liquor control um, to be able to allow alcohol sales for you guys. That was an executive order put into place on Thursday evening, uh, went into place on Friday at noon. Um, so yes, um, we'll get into the individual details of that, but that was on Thursday's executive order. And then on Friday, um, the governor um, is not calling it shelter in place. I don't know if we'll get to that point, but his policy is called stay safe and stay at home policy. Uh, which is um, all non-essential employees beginning Monday at 8 o'clock uh, this Monday that they will need to be staying home um, and not going to work. Um, obviously, I think you guys saw our email that went out um, on Friday afternoon that restaurants are a part of the essential workers and workforce um, and being able to stay open for the takeout, uh, drive through curbside delivery will continue. Um, I know I've received a lot of questions from you guys. Um, in regards to if if it gets worse, if shelter in place or federal or things like that, we will continue to keep everyone posted um, just so everyone knows um, in the Bay Area with the shelter in place uh, uh, executive orders out there, um, restaurants are still staying open for takeout uh, and delivery. Um, and we will continue to, to push that we need to be an essential service. 51% um, of the U.S. food dollar in the country comes from through restaurants. So uh, we know that, you know, grocery stores, uh, yes, can provide a service, but they, they can't provide all of the service. And you guys have the, the means by way of the food um, as well to, to provide to, to our Connecticut residents. So we will continue to work through, through that. Um, before I go through the next slide, I just uh, turn it over to Nicole. Um, just in regards to these executive orders, uh, Nicole, is there anything else you, you want to add?
Uh, hi, good morning, everyone. No, Scott, I think you've covered it all. Um, certainly, I'm happy to answer any questions. I know there's a new executive order coming out almost daily from the governor's office, um, updating things and changing things. Um, what's been most, the questions we've had um, from restaurateurs across the state have mostly been related to what they are and aren't able to do um, as far as alcohol goes. So I'm happy to answer any of those questions, but otherwise, I think you covered it. Thank you, Nicole. Um, so we're going to go into just a couple of the the, the questions here are what's happened and, and kind of the resources. So if you go to the next slide, Jennifer. Um, so uh, the addition of alcohol sales. Uh, obviously, I know for some, you know, I, I, I understand there's been a big ask about allowing mixed drinks and the cocktails and those things. Um, you got to understand even to get the alcohol um, through. Um, I give Nicole a lot of credit. It was not an easy just, hey, other states are doing it. I mean, obviously, you know, in Connecticut, we have our own challenges um, to be able to even do this, even in an emergency order situation. So I just wanted to quickly remind everybody, you know, right now you are not permitted to sell mixed drinks. Um, they have to be containers that, that are sealed and come from the wholesalers. Uh, if you have a permit and you've had a permit to sell growlers, you can continue to do that. Your hours have to um, stay consistent. Um, you know, with, with the same as a package store. Um, so understanding that if you are staying open later to, to sell the alcohol um, and obviously delivery is not a part of this, which I brought up before, um, you know, the delivery aspect. So I get it. I, I know some of you guys, you know, there are some other cities out there around the country. There's some other states that that are, you know, allowing a little bit more. Um, it's not something that we aren't at least communicating as best we can. We, we uh, but at the same time, you know, this is what you know came from DCP. Is obviously these are their guidelines, which I put up here so you guys know. Um, I understand, uh, you know, to some of you guys, that, you know, what how it either helps or doesn't help. You know, it's just, it's just one of the big things for us is, you know, I know people have gotten very creative around it. Um, you know, doesn't you know they're selling bottles of of liquor with garnishments and everything else to take home and make their own drinks. People are thinking outside the box with this. Um, and I think that I, I applaud you guys with that piece, but at the same time, understand um, that the mixed drinks piece is, you know, continue to ask, but I think there are a lot of, you know, more pressing issues that we're going to get into that are on the horizon that we're trying to focus um, the state legislators on. Um, and I know I'm, I'm getting some questions on the side, which, which is great, and kind of going back to these executive orders and understanding, please know from, the, from myself um, and everyone here on this call, kind of helping lead this call. I understand that takeout sales, uh, delivery, um, curbside is maybe at best 10 to 15% of your business. Um, that messaging has been loud and clear from us. Um, you will see it at the end in the letter. Um, uh, we understand that that you are hemorrhaging as restaurants right now and trying to survive. Um, the, the legislative lawmakers, in my opinion, as we continue to tell them, and you need to tell them as well if you have uh, conversations with them through email or phone calls or whatever else, or they're their own town halls that, you know, th this is not, you guys are staying open to possibly keep certain people employed, which is your hope, some of your staff, and and to try to provide a service. This, you guys are not staying open and selling alcohol and takeout as a means to to stay in business the way that you were. Um, that is loud and clear from us. That has continued to be communicated to our legislators um, throughout all of our conversations uh, through this process. We know you're putting yourself and others at risk to provide this service. Um, we commend you for that, but please know that there's none of us saying, oh, well, you guys are able to stay partially open, so you should be fine now. Like We understand that is not the case. You'll see later on as we get through this, this um, webinar here of what we're trying to do, but I know that some of the questions I'm getting um, uh, you know, through this process, please know that is not any of the messaging coming from myself, any of my staff, into the media. Um, you know, you can even talk about some of the stories that came up in the current today and other op-eds that we're working on to make sure people know that just because you guys are staying open for takeout uh, to go curbside and, and selling a little bit of alcohol, it, it is not um, in any means keeping you keeping you whole or even any partially whole. You're still um, very much worried, and we need we need relief, and we need relief now. So. Um, that's kind of the update on alcohol sales. Um, if you want to go to the next slide. <clears throat> so Ryan O'Donnell here is on the call. Um, we have, uh, you know, on the unemployment piece, and we know, as I talked about at the beginning of the call, of, of how many uh, thousands of workers have been, has unfortunately been laid off. I, I, I can't even imagine 
the days and, and the, the struggle you guys have had as restaurateurs, um, you know, through this process. Cause it's, but at the same time, we are trying to work diligently to, to help you and help those employees as well. But I at least want you guys, you know, to make sure you, you, you know about these couple different things. And, and I want to turn it over to Ryan real quick, because I know we've done a video through our Facebook group um, with Ryan and Yvette and some others just, just about, you know, how to file if there's questions or there's other things like that. So Ryan, if, if, if you want to just um, give an update here on the unemployment piece. Sure. Um, good morning, everybody. I appreciate um, everybody being on the call. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's a Sunday, but I think this shows the commitment our industry has to work together and push through this. So thank you. Um, with regard to unemployment, obviously there's, there's lots of different questions coming out about that right now. Um, but at the moment, there's really has not been a whole lot of changes from the traditional unemployment insurance um, procedure, other than the fact that they're waiving a lot of requirements right now. Um, they are waiving um, the need to be looking for work and waiving the need to check in on a weekly basis. They simply do not have the um, capacity right now to handle that. So there, it's a really good opportunity for um you know folks to i guess you know I, I would apply sooner than later um if uh folks have been laid off um i think they're just being a lot more relaxed in general about the criteria and standards um so i think if somebody has questions or concerns maybe they're concerned they're not doing something right uh, i think the best thing to do is just jump right on it uh get it done and if there's questions try to answer them on the back end but it's my understanding from the Department of Labor that they're being pretty flexible and fluid uh, with applications right now. So um, the only other concern that I would raise at this point um, is there is the shared work program offered by the CTDOL um, and folks can continue working for you with reduced hours and get uh, partial unemployment. The only issue with that is, you know, unfortunately, uh, and this is really putting employers in a bind, is that this uh, the federal uh, the new federal leave laws that came out last week really put employers in a bad spot with regard to keeping folks on the payroll right now and that they're asking for they're putting up giant liabilities um, for both paid sick leave and expanded FMLA and they're asking employers to pay for that up front so as much as the government's talking about keeping folks employed at least from the federal standpoint, the policies they've enacted um, don't seem to recognize how businesses work and certainly appear to work against the objective of keeping folks employed by asking employers to pay for the sick leave time up front and then promising to get them on the back end with some tax rebates that we may or may never see, may or may not see. So, uh, there's a, certainly there are, there are some strong disincentives right now to keeping um, more people on through a shared work program, um, but I certainly understand the need to keep folks employed as well. So uh, there's certainly arguments on both sides of the equation there. Thank you, Ryan. Um, I, obviously, you know we understand the other piece of the issues right now with unemployment. Some of the biggest questions we're getting are, you know, what about the penalties or the risk down the road for me of letting, you know, 100 plus people go um, and how that's going to affect my merit rating and all those. Please understand that is um, <clears throat> a part of our conversations right now, uh, which you'll see in the letter. Uh, you know, obviously it's more about making sure how you've done it or if your employees are asking questions. Ryan's contact information um, will be at the end of this slide so you guys have it. He'll be, it is a great resource to help you. It's more of making sure, you know, if you did do it, which most of you guys, almost all of you had to do that, um, making sure you're providing your staff with the proper um, information. Please look into the sharedworkct.com uh, piece if you're bringing people in for part-time and how that kind of works. It's more from the employer side of how that how that's set up where, you know, you might have people that are working and you would file as an employer to try to get the partial unemployment piece as opposed to the employee. Um, but also I know a lot of the big questions on the unemployment is the risk that, that, you know, you laying people off, how that's going to affect, um, you as a business moving forward. And that is without question, a federally and a state conversation that we are having, um, you know, they, they've, 
they've obviously never seen the number of people having to apply for unemployment during this time um, in the history of Connecticut and also as a country. So um, it is at the top of the list. I just want to go back for one second because I did see a quick, a couple of quick hits to kind of get some clarity on the liquor piece and the alcohol. Um, you you can sell beyond 8, 8 p.m. That I believe, and Nicole, correct me if I'm wrong. I think the the package store hours are 10 p.m. So you can't sell alcohol after 10 p.m. Um, if you're a delivery or whatever else and your restaurant is still open, but up till 10 p.m. So that eight o'clock window of when when um, we shut the businesses down, I know people freaked out on takeout, everything else that Monday, it was just 8 p.m. that in-house dining was changing. But as far as the requirements for being able to sell alcohol um, and, and what you can do, it is it is obviously following the package store hours and the state law of Connecticut. Um, but you know, I know it said non-alcoholic and everything else. We've got that stuff fixed, um, at least from the DCP side. So just wanted to just quickly kind of going through some of those questions. Um, I'll get into the the vendors and the delay and deferment of cost a little bit farther on. I know there's been some of those questions as well. So um, uh, Nicole, did I miss anything or Ryan on these two pieces? You did not. Okay. All uh, right. Um, yep. Just quickly, um, Ryan, uh, we do have a question if self employed individuals can apply for unemployment. Sure. Uh, Self-employed individuals and business owners can uh, can indeed apply for unemployment if they regularly draw a salary from the operation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah. All right. So just going to the next slide. Um, uh, this system's a little finicky, but our next slide is SBA loans. Um, I get this. This has been a, a big topic for conversation right now. The loans are between 2.75 and 3.75 up to 30 years. Um, the SBA disaster relief uh, loans that are there. The governor, um, our state of Connecticut was one of the first states in line for this. If you haven't applied, if it's something that you want to look to do, um, you know, the information is there. We also put a video up. Um, Bill Clark and Jason Hurth from Clark Hurth are uh, our accountants here at the CRA put together a video of just kind of questions, uh, FAQs, as well as the best way to do this process. Um, I get it, guys. I understand, you know, the risk of taking out more loans and, and being able to pay it back later. But obviously, this was the first step with the government um, of what they did on a federal level with the SBA. Um, but but do understand that that uh, that there are other other avenues that we are pursuing but right now when you're asking about what's out there for loans what's out there to be able to apply for um and understand that the this site um they i think they told me yesterday uh i was on a call actually i was on a call with um president trump two days ago with some of my board um the head of the sba got on they said they had over two and a half million hits to the website daily uh their website so it is timing out there is many many people applying for for these loans but you know, please, please work with us. Use use our site, use our resources to try to help you through this process. It is something uh, you were going after on the disaster relief loans. I just wanted to make sure we talked about this because uh, people have been asking questions. Um, again, it goes back to though, like you know, what else could be out there on the horizon, which I'm going to get into in a second, um, and hoping that that we do get some some other things besides maybe some loans, maybe some lower interest grants, things of that nature. So. Um, just going into uh, any questions or, or I'm sorry, not questions. We'll go to the question at the end. Um, anything else, Yvette, that I missed on the SBA loans? No, I think we're good. Okay. Jennifer, next slide. All right. A lot of the questions kind of going up on the side um, that I, I'm getting individually or as a group. Um, first and foremost, business interruption insurance. Um, please know that that's probably been one of the biggest topics or questions. I know once this thing hit, a lot of you guys had called your insurance agency um, and tried to push to us to say, hey, you know, they're not, my policy doesn't cover the COVID-19, um, the virus, and that is there. You know, what can you do? What, what can we do as a state? What can we do federally? Um, I can promise you, your, your frustration has been heard um, throughout the country, um, not only in the state, um, but the way that that this, you know, um, kind of has been happening. But at the same time, that is part of our letter to to our to the governor, which you're going to see in a second, um, as well as federally, what we've asked for as well. Um, I know there's been some states uh, like New Jersey, 
um, some others that have tried to pass or put a bill on the floor to try to, I guess, put pressure on the insurance agencies to add this into the policy after the fact. Um, I mean, I, I can let Ryan chime in for a second as well. We've had many conversations over the last week about this piece um, because I think that the, the challenge that, that we face with the insurance companies are, you know, if we can get the support from federal and state government um, to help you guys through this process, I don't think we, we want to get into a legal battle with these insurance companies, um, at least initially. I think that that's why we're trying to go to, to our legislators and our lawmakers from the governor to all the way up to the president through the National Restaurant Association that we need grants and we need no interest loans. We need other ways or even put, putting money in to help offset this business interruption insurance. But understand even a lot of your policies on how a business interruption insurance in your policy would work. You'd have to have specific damage to your restaurant. Um, you know, hurricane, things like that, and be able to prove the damage. Obviously, the economic damage is one thing, but that's really a lot of the, the, the pieces to this with the business interruption insurance piece um, that we've had some conversations with insurance leaders as well. Um, but I do think that that's why we are looking at other other avenues to try to get you guys cash in hand now um, and support, um, you know, because obviously you guys have been calling and emailing and asking. This is one of the top questions, but I at least wanted to have it to be a topic and understand you know, from the legality side and the challenges of what that would be to try to make these insurance agencies pay pay business interruption insurance um, for, you know, how many claims that would be out there. I believe I heard something on Thursday that the, the Hartford had over 1,800 claims um, in a day, and obviously they denied all of them, but the number of claims in that piece. And then also um, I had one of my board members put up a great point. Let's say we got the insurance agencies here to to recoup you and, and say, yes, okay, we'll, we'll pay it off. Well, where's the money coming from first and foremost, which is what we're talking with our lawmakers about. Secondly, you're going to, you know, restaurants, the industry specifically, if they were just to protect us and go after and pay off their, your business interruption insurance, your policies, your premiums, um, you'd, you'd probably struggle to get insurance down the road. There's so many risks that are at play if, if we just made this about the insurance agencies with us. Um, and this, that's really what we're trying to share with the lawmakers as well, um, because we don't want to be viewed that way down the line. And I, obviously someone would have to pay it. And that's why we're trying to look to um, our state and federal government to, to help offset these challenges and these, these lack of uh, revenue costs that you need and this infusion of money and cash that you need now to help keep your business afloat while we get through this crisis. So um, Ryan, do you want to chime in, chime in from a legal side on the business interruption insurance? Uh, sure, Scott. Um, <clears throat> you know, with regard to the business interruption insurance, um, most policies only cover physical damage. So if it's business interruption that stems from physical damage, um, you'd be okay. There's even some, some court, so there's even some case law where, um, there was, you know, physical damage to other structures in the neighborhood and it, that required coverage. But really, uh, the insurance companies clamped down on pandemics following some of the swine flu and SARS issues in the last decade. Um, they really clamped down and, you know, it's simply not there right now for coverage. And with, you know, the idea that the federal government's going to interfere with the contractual relationship between parties um, is simply not very realistic. Now, might they make up some sort of uh, fund or way to provide another avenue of revenue or resources? Um, you know, yeah, that's that's possible. They might have some sort of bailout fund, essentially, um, for companies that that didn't get help from that, that don't have a contract that covers this. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it, it's, it's upon it. And this is not what people want to hear. I understand that, but you know, these policies are, are pretty explicit in that they don't cover non-physical damages. Um, and yeah, like a, a bailout fund, like for the banks and for wall street, that would be absolutely what the government should be talking about. But realistically, they're not, you know, none of the courts are going to say, well, there was a contract here, um, you know, insurance coverage contract, and the language was clear, and it's unfortunate that that there wasn't coverage of it, you know, the coverage wasn't provided in the language, but I just don't think that's a, that's a, that's a smart use of our resources right now, 
um, to go down that road. I think we're much better off talking about, okay, this is the situation. How can the government, um, you know, help out here, right? As opposed, and, and that, that help is not going to come through rewriting the existing agreements or contracts. I think it's going to come through something like a bailout. Thanks, Ryan. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, yeah, so as we continue to go, you guys will get some more updates. I feel like I'm getting a lot of questions on the right about, you know, deferring payment stuff. So understand um, the deferring payments. I kind of made a short list um, here of some of the things that, that we've gotten from you guys about your worry and, and hey, you know, you need, you, you need not to have to pay these bills, how to face it, what's going on. Um, obviously, utilities you guys saw with Eversource and UI and um, a lot of the, you know, CNG, a lot of these people have deferred your payments. If they haven't, I know there's been some individual um, utility companies that, that some of you guys have in, in your parts of the state. Please communicate with us if you're getting pushback, um, if you're not able to defer your payments. But I know that kind of came down from the governor as well and the pressure we put on. I mean, that was one of the first asks. And obviously, I think Eversource um, st st uh, stepped up initially, but other people are following suit with that. Um, the filing for federal and state taxes, I know um, those things are, are looking to obviously be pushed back to the July 15th deadline, how that's going to impact you guys um, as businesses, you know, as we continue to get more of those details. The sales tax um, deferment, or for, and I'll talk about forgiveness in a second. I know that's a huge one. I know that's a lot of dollars that you're paying to the state um, every single month, um, and that's, that's obviously going to be in our letter that I'll get to in a second. Um, mortgages and loans. Um, I would I would ask you guys to reach out if you have if you do own your property um, and you're paying it through a mortgage and a loan as opposed to a lease or rent. Um, from the direction I've gotten from a lot of the board members, please reach out to your bank. Um, have that individual conversation um, about what they're able able to help you with or or able to defer or whatever that might be. I've heard some great some great um, um, support from some of the banks. Um, obviously, the banks are not in a crisis like they were in 2008 with with the stock market, things like that. They they actually have some liquidity and they're trying to help, and that's even coming from federal down. So please reach out to your bank for, from the mortgage loan side and and try to get some feedback. If you get some positive responses, please share it with us and help us with, with some of these banks. And we're trying to obviously talk to the the Connecticut and some of the regional banks here to see how they're being able to help you guys. Um, support you uh, with with those payments. Rent and lease, same thing. Um, I'm sure you've already had a conversation with your landlord. Um, I know that uh, you know we're we're not to say we're kind of following suit a little bit with Governor uh, Cuomo out in New York. Um, I know from a mortgage and, and I mean from a rent and lease standpoint, obviously for residential, he tried to defer those payments or, or obviously not allow penalties. It's something I don't know if to the business side in New York yet, but at least in Connecticut. It's all conversations. We are trying to look at your largest pieces of, of dollars that you're going to have to spend um, over the next, you know, you know, 30 to 45 days. And how can we either defer them? How can we kind of help you guys um, not have to pay those right away? And how how you can work with that? But obviously, I think if you don't have a, if you haven't had a conversation with your landlord, um, you know, if you're renting or leasing your space, I I would say to you, please open up and start that conversation now. I know we're hearing good things and we're hearing bad things to that process, and we're trying to work with our lawmakers um, to see how they can help um, in that process. The other one is vendors. I know uh, the purveyors uh, to your liquor distributors to um, you know I've I've heard you know people being posted. I've heard different things you know throughout the throughout the throughout the state and obviously that's a conversation we're having with with our lawmakers um to see what they could do to help delay by 60 or 90 days um some of your costs to your vendors um what they can do at a state level um but also i'm trying to have conversations with some of the heads of 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 businesses and our vendors that that work really close to our association to see how they can help um because at the end of the day um let's not let, let's not lose sight of the fact that you know restaurants in Connecticut, and I don't have the exact stat, but I'm pretty sure and accurate, we generate the most sales tax uh, than any other industry um, in the state. Um, we are, you know, the, the largest small business force that there is. Um, we need to, to be able to stay with 8,500 restaurants and we get through this crisis. We need to come back at that level and try to get that support. <clears throat> so I hope that our vendors and our landlords and our banks and everyone else need to understand that we are in this together and we need their support through this um, through this time. So 
we are doing everything in our power as an association. I just would would push back to you guys to say, please, you know, reach out, let us know how we can help individually. But also, you know, you guys have probably already started your own work individually with your restaurants, but making sure you're, you're having those conversations um, with your vendors, with your landlords, with your banks. <clears throat> and then the other one is the property tax. Um, I know that's been a question because some of you guys, uh, the property tax in your town is coming up and that's usually a large chunk of money. Um, the initial conversation from the governor is he was saying, oh, that's, that goes down to the first selectmen and the mayors of the towns making that decision. Um, we're gonna continue to talk to him about that, um, whether we have to go to individual towns um, you know, and, and try to see how we could possibly defer that payment um, if you guys haven't paid it already and looking at that because that's an, we're just trying to look at all the lines of cost that you guys have. If I'm missing something, please let us know and what ways we can try to help support you by deferring or forgiving or abating, whatever that we can do. Um, that, that's really our goal through the association right now um, is we are fielding calls and we are trying to make them as well. So um, I leave that, uh, uh, Nicole, did I miss anything um, just from, from deferring payment side? No, you did not. Okay. All right. Um, next slide, Jen. All right. So if you guys know with the Connecticut Restaurant Association, um, we are a partner with the National Restaurant Association. I've been on, I probably average about three conference calls a day with National, um, trying to figure out what they're doing on a national level uh, to to support you as a whole um, as restaurants. And I uh, just wanna kind of quickly go through for some of you guys that don't know kind of what's been going on down in Washington. If you, you guys watch the news or at least seeing things that have passed or haven't passed. So um, there has been currently two bills that have passed um, and been signed by the president. So the first was COVID bill, what we're calling COVID bill number one. Um, it was passed on March and signed on March 5th. That was that emergency spending bill that $8.3 billion really didn't affect us at all. That was about being able to start provide resources around the country to try to slow down um, the virus. So that was that was initially, I think I was actually in DC with about seven board members when that was being passed and being signed. Uh, COVID bill number two um, was written by the House uh, through the House and the House Democratic leadership. Um, it is called the Families First Corona, Coronavirus Response Act. Um, that was signed um, three days ago by the president. Uh, what that does is it protects all employees um, around the country. If they were to be sick, if they had someone in their family that they had to take care of that was sick with the virus. Um, and I also believe, and, and I'll turn this over to Ryan in a second to give some updates as well. Um, and also if you have people home from school and you have to be able to watch your, your, your kids from school. So um, how this works right now is uh, the government um, and putting in the billions of dollars that they have in this bill number two. Uh, you as an employer, though, as a small business employer would have to, and this is the kind of the challenges and why we try to push back to try to get some support. Um, but if you have people that were to get sick um, in your restaurant and they had to take the two weeks off, you would have to pay that two weeks initially. You would get a, a dollar for dollar, 100% reimbursement, but it would come in the form of a tax credit later on. So it's not an initial payment and support, which is kind of a little bit the, the frustration um, that we have. And we've tried to we've tried to voice that with this. But uh, Ryan did a really good job. I believe it's up on our website as well, just kind of explaining this Families First Coronavirus Response Act. And I kind of will turn it over to Ryan real quick because I'll let you kind of, I think I might have missed a couple things and do a better job than me explaining it. So go ahead, Ryan. Thanks, Scott. I appreciate it. Um, although you're definitely handling all this um, beautifully. So um, I'll try to add what I can. Um, I think, you know, first and foremost, everyone needs to understand there's two components of this, right? And unfortunately, of this uh, Families First Corona Response Act, um, there's two components. There's the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act component of it, and there's the Emergency Family and Medical Leave Expansion Act component of it, okay? And they both, um, and they could, they both apply to uh, private sector employers with fewer than 500 employees. Um, so most restaurants, not Apple and Google and all them for some reason, but most restaurants. Um, and under the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act, there's six criteria, right? And if any one of your employees um, fits into one of these criteria, they are eligible for up to 80 hours of paid sick time. 
right? They're full time employees. These six areas are one, they're subject to the employee subject to a federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order related to COVID. Um, two, they've been advised, the employee's been advised by a healthcare provider to self quarantine due to concerns related to COVID. Number three is the employee is experiencing symptoms of COVID 19 and seeking a medical diagnosis. I think that one is particularly problematic for employers because, you know, experiencing symptoms is a very broad uh, phrase, right? I mean, Look, I have a headache. I, am I experiencing symptoms of COVID-19? Um, and I'm trying to get a response via telemedicine. Is that seeking a medical diagnosis? The answer to both of those could be, could very well be yes. Um, so I think you're gonna see a lot of folks going out um, under n number three. Uh, number four is the employee is caring for an individual subject to an order uh, of quarantine or isolation. Uh, Number five, I think, is going to be the one that affects most people, frankly. It's caring for a son or daughter um, if the school or place of care has been closed, right, or the child care provider is unavailable. Um, I think since pretty much anybody with or every child in the school is out of school and most daycares are closed, um, if your employee has a child, a school-aged child, then number five applies to them. Um, and then number six is the employee is experiencing substantially similar conditions as specified by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. That's sort of a catch-all they've left at the end. Um, so the way it works is that the employee who is, uh, if they're in the top, if they fit into the first three categories, it's five hundred dollars a day, uh, or five hundred eleven dollars a day, and five thousand a hundred ten dollars in the aggregate total. Uh, for somebody in categories four, five, or six, they can earn up to $200 a day and $2,000 in the aggregate. Um, and employers are prohibited from requiring employees to use other types of leave before using the paid sick leave. Uh, they're allowed to, if they have other leave, then they want to work it, you know, in conjunction with this, that's fine, but you can't force them to take other leave beforehand. Um, uh, by Wednesday, 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 we're supposed to have a notice up. It's supposed to be a notice in all restaurants by Wednesday about these, about this new law. Um, they haven't, the feds haven't created that notice yet. So as soon as they create that notice, we will let you know. Um, but right now, just be aware that you're going to have something posted by Wednesday and this law goes into effect April 2nd. Um, so you have a little bit of time to evaluate your workforce and its needs and figure out um, you know, how this is going to affect you. So, so that, that's the paid sick leave. The second component of this delightful new law is the Emergency Family Medical Leave Expansion Act, okay? And so this is for employers, um, for employees who have um, been employed for at least 30 days to take up to 12 weeks of leave under FMLA to care for a son or daughter under the, under the age of 18 if their school or place of care has closed, right? While the first 10 days of this expanded leave is unpaid, after 10 days, the employee is entitled to be paid two thirds of their regular rate of pay for the number of hours they would otherwise be normally scheduled to work, right? So if they're home from school, or so if their kids are home from school, they're gonna get 12 weeks, the first 10 days are unpaid, after that, you're on the hook for up to $10,000. The cap's $10,000, um, which you have to pay all this up front. Um, so that's it, right? That's the, um, those, those are the obligations. And um, you know, employers need to be aware uh, that the notice has to go up by Wednesday. As soon as we get the notice, we'll let you know. Um, and you have until April 2nd to put these into effect. All right, uh, Scott, if there's any other questions, um, I'll try to jump in, but that's all from my end on this. Thank you, Ryan. I think, you know, there's obviously this this bill, COVID bill number two, this Families First Coronavirus Response Act was done quickly, um, was signed very quickly, it was done in about a day and a half. And I think there's definitely some areas um, of concern of just how the process is gonna work. Uh, but I do think, you know, we're gonna continue to keep you guys posted 
on what you need to do, um, questions you have, um, please just just uh, make sure you're you're sending us notes. Um, it'll be in our emails. You know, when when things come up coming up to Wednesday or whatever else, as this starts to take a little bit more shape. Um, but I just wanted you guys to know. Obviously, that was the second bill that was passed on March 19th federally. Um, the bigger issue, the bigger bill right now that we've been working tirelessly on really since March 5th um, is what they're calling COVID bill number three or what we're calling it a national. Um, it's the stimulus package. It's what President Trump has talked about, this $1, tr $1 trillion um, package um, to help support the economy, help support the businesses there. Um, you guys probably hopefully have already done this, um, the call to action. Um, it's text, you can do it right now as you're listening to me, if you're on your computer or if you can take your phone away. If you text recovery to 52886, it'll pull up um, a website that, that you just have to fill out your name, your, um, your business, and you can write a little note. It'll go directly to your legislator. Um, just so you guys know, look at that, 219,000 emails have already been sent. Um, the most ever through a national action alert campaign, I believe was about 70,000. So inside, we, we they started this literally like two days ago. We've already had 220,000. I would I would tell you, your staff, your your spouse, your uh, fr your neighbor, anybody can send this. Um, I think you know it's actnow. It looks like io slash recovery. But if you just text the text recovery to 52886. Um, you can do it, but people have been asking me, oh, well, I've got you know, a restaurateur that I know down in North Carolina. Can they send it? This is this will go directly from where you send it, the zip code you put in. It'll go to your U.S. congressmen, uh, U.S. senators as well, you know, um, directly from wherever you are and wherever you're putting your place of business. This, The reason why this is so important right now um, to everybody on the call is the stimulus package has not been defined yet. Everyone from Senator McConnell um, leading the Senate to uh, Nancy Pelosi, to Chris Murphy put something out the other day about um, his Main Street Emergency Grants Program. Everyone feels like they have an idea down there at Congress of how they're gonna save everybody. Our biggest ask right now and what is in this Recovery Act is a letter that National put together that really touches on a lot of these, these, these topics of restaurants were one of the first, if not the first um, businesses to close. We should be the first in line for support and recovery. SBA loans aren't going to do it for us. We need either no interest loans. We need grants. Um, we need help with the business interruption insurance piece. We need help with unemployment solvency to unemployment uh, merit and issues down the road for restaurants coming back, um, trying to employ people. We need help with all kinds of areas that, that this one Point three trillion dollar package. It's changing numbers and, and costs on a daily basis. But that's really what that, if you saw that through Facebook, it's on our Facebook page. I think I shared it. Um, please put it up on all your restaurant social media sites um, to ask anybody and everyone that they can spill it out. It doesn't have to be, oh, I have to be a restaurant tour. No, it can literally be my wife can send it because really all we're asking is to support restaurants and, and we need the help. And everyone, obviously restaurants touch their lives in different ways. But we need to make sure when this stimulus package gets put together and finalized and, si and passed in both the chambers and signed by the president, that there is dollars out there that are going to help support restaurants. Um, that's that's the first and foremost. That's our federal push. That's what we're continuing to do. Um, yes, it's great to see 220,000 people um, that have already filled that out and taken the time. Um, but I do ask that that you just continue to push that through because the the stimulus the COVID. Uh, bill number three. Uh, they're trying to put something on the floor as early as tomorrow. Um, obviously, the Senate uh, down there, our U.S. Senate, has said they're not going to leave or break um, until this gets done. Um, some of the things that that there, I can promise you that restaurants are being talked about, um, which is a good thing, um, but we can't stop the pressure. We need to be continuing to, to send this out, hit their inboxes, hit Murphy's inbox, Blumenthal's, Larson's, Johanna Hayes, you know, De Rosa Delora, um, you know, Courtney, Himes, all the people that actually I was down in D.C. two weeks ago and I sat with all of them and it was really at the beginning stages of the coronavirus. We did not know what to expect, but I can promise you that 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 is our um, our federal ask. So uh, please know that, you know, as I am on another call here a little bit later today with the National Restaurant Association, that that if you watch the news on a, on a national level, that's really what's being worked on down there federally. Um, we did have a call with, uh, I was on a call with over a, th a thousand business um, administrative leaders with President Trump on Thursday. 
um, where he, you know, he talked a little bit about this. He did bring up restaurants actually in his in his conversation with us, which is great to hear. You guys got to understand, there's a lot of small businesses out there with their hand out that are like, oh, I'm being, I'm, you know, I'm in trouble. I need support. I need these things. So we need to continue to put the pressure to say we need to be at the front of the line federally. And what does that mean? I know there will be a package, but the more pressure we put on, the better the package is going to look for you as restaurateurs to get the support that you need. So. Um, that is really on a federal side. Uh, any questions, really? I mean, I, I don't have anybody from National on, but um, I just I want you guys to know that you know part of what I do a, a, as an executive director is to try to work um, in lockstep with National to know what's going on. Um, this has really been uh, a lot of great work so far in, into the pipeline down there. But um, you know, if you have relationships, I would ask of you if you have any relationships with any of your U.S. congressmen or U.S. senators. Um, and Congresswomen, please send them notes. Please, please. I mean, you don't have to get into all the details. If you want me to help you, I'm happy to. I was talking with um, Avi down in New Haven with, with Rosa Delora. I know I talked to Phil Barnett about um, the other day, just, just about his relationship with Chris Murphy. Like they need to know the dire situation. A lot of you guys have texted me stuff at the beginning of this saying, hey, take out and delivery you know, it's not, it's, it's not helping me. It's, it's, it, you know, I'm, I'm just doing this to try to keep a couple staff members open. It's, you know, and hoping to do a service to the community. They need to hear that from you. They need to know that whatever gets passed down there on this COVID bill, number, number three has resources for you immediately. Cause you guys need this influx of cash um, today, not, not weeks from now, not months from now, you need it now. And, and that's obviously the bigger push that we're making on a federal level that I want to make sure you guys are um, no, and are clear on. So um, the other piece. So if we go to the the next slides, um, I will uh, just to update. So that is a federal side. That's a and and federally is trying to put that one trillion dollar stimulus package together. But you know we're not going to stop on the efforts that Nicole Griffin, our contract lobbyist, is um, amazing at what she does. She's been working tirelessly like us to to work with the governor's office. I mean, she's on a, on a, I think she talks to someone on the governor's staff probably every, every other hour um, about issues that are affecting our industry that are reaching out to us. I think I talked about the shelter in place, how that could affect us. Are we in a central business? Um, what's going on with the alcohol piece to, you know, we're working with David Lehman, the, the head of the DECD, um, making sure that what they're, what they're planning. So the state obviously is the next level. Um, of what they can offer. Um, I know some of them have said, hey, we wanna see what happens federally, but we really can't wait for that. And we definitely can't wait for that, but we've kind of been telling them that. So uh, just so you guys know, a week ago, we sent a letter to the governor. Um, you guys probably saw it through all of our, our social media channels and those that probably had eight or nine different bullets that we were asking for and support. Um, and you know, with that said, <clears throat> we've kind of um, changed you know, um, <clears throat> our our messaging and our update and what you guys why this is a great webinar today um, our next steps is we sent a letter yesterday morning to the governor and all of our legislative leaders um, and and you can see by this letter which will get out um, we'll email it to everybody here within the next hour or so um, you, you can tell by the letter that our messaging is without question uh, much stronger talking about the dire situation that you guys are facing and we really focused on four specific bullets four specific things we feel the state can do right now to help you. Um, and you know the, the, the initial one obviously is the immediate and significant capital injections. Uh, David Lehman at the DECD has talked about this in a couple of his different calls this past week. Um, they're saying they're gonna hopefully come out with something on tomorrow, maybe Tuesday, we're hoping tomorrow, but it can't just be the SBA loans. It has to be grants, it has to be lines of credit, zero interest loans for the, from the state that, that restaurants can use now um, to help you guys survive. Um, that obviously is our top line. Um, that you, I can promise you that they're hearing us loud and clear on that one. Um, <clears throat> at the same time to the federal stimulus, the same way. I mean, the way that the federal stimulus, $300 billion grant program for small business that they put in, um, just so you guys know, the way they put the criteria is, if you guys were to receive any grant dollars, 
um, you actually could be forgiven on those if you if you follow certain steps, if you hire, rehire your staff, if you do certain things. Those are some of the great uh, messaging points we're hearing. We just haven't seen it finalized yet, but the same thing we're asking for state is, yeah, a loan is one thing, but a grant is something totally different, or it's there ways to to forgive some of those if we do the certain things to get our business back into place. So we we know you guys need immediate and significant capital injections. That's that's our top line piece. The second one, which I know a lot of you guys have just sent me text and questions through this process, is forgiving the sales tax payments. Um, we're asking for forgiveness. Obviously, the state of New York did deferment of it. Um, we'd love forgiveness for three months. That's our big ask of them. I don't know if they'll forgive, but at worst case, they need to defer it. Um, just like Como did in New York, um, where you don't have to have those large um, <clears throat> sales tax payments over your head that you'd have to send in <clears throat> from the state. And obviously in New York, they deferred it and they eliminated penalties and interest um, through that deferment period. So um, we're, we're continuing to tell them, hey, look what, look what New York's doing, but also if you could do more, it would be even better. Um, the other piece is, I know we talked about business interruption insurance, um, but this is kind of that point I talked about of, you know, rather than forcing our community to resolve it with insurance coverage, you know, we're trying to ask for, you know, I know an insurance program or providing immediate benefits, whether that comes in the form of the grants, whether that comes in the forms of no interest loans or ways to offset the business interruption insurance that you're impacted. So we're making sure the governor knows of that. And the last one is obviously addressing the unemployment, obviously for your employees of making sure that it's solvent and what they're doing with the rainy day fund and other ways to make sure that people can be paid during this time, but also the challenges for you as a business of, you know, like we talked about the merit, the penalties of letting the people go that were not of your choice um, without any question. It was a, it was a state mandated shutdown, um, but making sure that those, those conversations are continuing to be had. This letter, you can read the other meat of it, um, talking about why we need it. This went in the Hartford Current. It hit the Hartford Current yesterday. There was a great article. I don't know if any of the guys from Naples Pizza are on or Jamie or Cheryl from Bears um, or, you know, uh, Todd or anybody else from Cafe Aura. I really appreciate all that everyone is doing. And there's a, there's a front page of, of the Current right now that showcased how amazing our industry is and how much you guys are going above and beyond in a crisis for the community. Um, I can't thank you guys enough. And those stories, <clears throat> excuse me, are is what is our driving force in this letter. So my ask of you right now, there's a couple of asks. One is this is going to go out um, publicly through our email chain, and we have a petition that we've worked with National to set up. So if you'll see it right here that that Jennifer put up, um, when you get when you get the letter, it'll say click here. You just have to fill out uh, your name, your company, and zip code. It doesn't go to any legislator, I don't believe. It just it's just a chance for us to to uh, actually it might go to legislature. I got to go back with national how this works, but I'd love to see 10,000 people sign this. Um, I'm hoping for more, um, but the more that we can, the more push that we can put pressure back on the governor and, and legislative leaders for you guys need to be the front of the line and support. But um, this is just the letter on the left side. Obviously Jennifer has already submitted um, her information into it, but we will send that to you guys immediately after we get off this call. So you guys can see the letter. Um, those are the things that we're trying to do. We're not going to stop conversations. Um, <clears throat> I guess I'm just going to turn it quickly back over to Nicole. Um, is there anything that I missed? I mean, a lot of this, so you guys know, I mean, without Nicole, we wouldn't definitely not have the help and support that we have. So Nicole, thank you so much for your time, even, you know, through this process, but is there anything else that I, I missed for, for the state, the state actions? No, Scott, I think you covered it all. Um, it was such a large group on this call, though I, I would like to say it, it's going to help us out a lot if you all can um, spend a few minutes emailing your legislators. I think Scott's going to provide a platform for that at some point with this letter. Um, we're trying to pressure legislators to go to their leadership and say that the hospitality industry needs help today, not in three weeks, but today. Um, and then they, in turn, are taking that pressure to the governor's office um, to try to get them to do something. We're told that some kind of stimulus package will be coming out from the administration in early this week. Um, you know, I, I don't know what it's going to look like yet. We don't, I think they're in the, the planning stage right now. So any pressure that can be put on legislators and the governor's office from uh, restaurateurs will be really helpful. If 250 people on this call get off the phone and email and um, send this letter or post it on social media and, and put the pressure out there, it's only going to be helpful um, as we move forward and try to get them to do something for the hospitality industry. Thank you, Nicole. And, and just a couple of quick questions before I turn it over to Yvette. Um, 
I know if you guys are reading information about federal, <clears throat> the federal stimulus packages and these grants, like they've said, oh, well, you know, some people have pushed back and said, hey, you have to make sure that you didn't let your people go. Um, I can promise you that it, we've already pushed back on that and the furloughed piece. And if you've laid people off, it, it, it um, dates back to March 1st. So if you've had to let people go, which obviously it's beyond that for us when we had to shut down. Um, so you will still be eligible. I know we've gotten some calls because if you read the fine print right now of some of these stimulus packages saying, oh, well, if, you, if you're a business and you've already started letting people go, you're not going to be eligible for these grants or these forgiveness loans or anything else. That is not the case. And we will continue to push that. So I know a lot of you guys are asking us those questions. Um, please know that that we are continuing to keep you guys posted through that process. But the way that I heard it as of yesterday at five o'clock, um, they're furloughing it, um, backdating. If you let anybody go before March 1st, that's one thing, but after March 1st, which obviously March 16th is when we had the shutdown. So um, just so you guys are clear on that, that that's coming from federal. And I would assume state would follow suit if they were to open up any of these grants um, or no interest loans or low interest loans, whatever um, the DECD is going to look to hopefully roll out here soon. So um, I guess that, that for me is, I guess the, the agenda I have, I'm turn it back over to Yvette um, to see if I can help answer any additional questions that have come through. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, we have a lot of questions and I'm just trying to go through and uh, kind of group them and get some of these questions out. So let me just get started with some of them. Um, First, is there, as far as restaurants uh, reopening, do we have any insight as to a timetable of reopening? Yeah, so as of right now, um, the executive order that was signed um, goes through April 30th. Um, I know for some of you guys, you know, that that's big if we don't know that, but that is the date that has been set um, through, through the governor, um, as well as in line with New York and New Jersey. Um, I can promise you that we are um, having those conversations on a daily basis. Obviously, we know the curve is spiking right now um, in our state and around us. Um, but, you know, we are trying to hopefully get through this as quick as we can and, and possibly opening sooner. But that is the exact that's the language in the executive order. Um, they, they, there is language in there that he can he can make a new executive order to move that date up or we can also push it back farther. So I think the more that we can try to do to educate people on the social distancing and and staying um you know, and keeping people home, non-essential employees, hopefully that helps us uh, as well throughout this next week to keep people um, home and staying safe and slow this curve down. I'm hoping we can put some pressure to possibly open earlier than that, but April 30th is the date that was set on the executive order. Thank you, Scott. In regards to the um, deferment of tax taxes, just two questions here. If you can just repeat in regards to the, the state sales tax, I know we're asking for deferments there. Um, is there, do we have any insight as far as sales tax that are due on the first of the month? And then also if you can just address any deferments on pass through taxes. Sure. Um, I would say th those conversations as far as the current sales tax um, were obviously Nicole is having directly and myself with the letter. Um, obviously we saw the governor of New York um, make, make his update yesterday uh, about One deferring. <clears throat> Excuse Three. me. Yvette, do you mind? Thank you. Um, just trying to explain things to you that we're going to do with Kate. Like, you should, should be trying to do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I'm not sure if that worked. Scott, are you there? I'm still here. Sorry. Um, so, I mean, looking good about Anybody that's on caller four, if you don't mind muting your phone. We should do the same thing. I don't know if we can if we can mute them themselves so that. Um, so just getting back to your question, Yvette, I think the biggest thing is. Sorry, I'm trying to mute all. It is not. If anybody, um, can everyone just mute your phone? Okay, Scott, are you there? All right, I'll, I'll try again. So it looks like it's just caller four number. If you have number caller four on your thing, do you mind just muting your phone? Because it's just getting the background noise that's in there. Um, all right, so yeah, so I think we are still waiting for updates from the governor as far as the current sales tax, whether there's forgiveness or deferment. 
um, and, and pass through um, all of those things. Obviously, Bill Clark is not on our call, but our accountant, um, we're continuing to provide you guys guidance and information that he has given on <clears throat> things that are happening, um, whether they're federal or state uh, sales tax deadlines and pushback. Um, we will continue to, to update you. It is on our website right now. I know that Bill had provided some information um, <clears throat> and uh, making sure as soon as we know anything on a specific to sales tax, uh, you'll be the first to know in this group um, and beyond. And then obviously uh, any deferment um, piece to when you have to file um, as well, because some of that has already been updated and is up on our site, but there's probably some more things that we're still asking for as well. Scott, I'm sorry with the interruption. I wasn't sure. Did you mention pass through taxes? I did not. Um, I just uh, I I believe that, and and I don't want to turn it over to Nicole because I know we've talked about it briefly, but I don't I don't know if that deadline has been pushed back. Um, I know there was like about four or five bullets that Bill had sent us that I think we put up there on the different um, uh, deadlines that had been moved back. Do you know if pass through was a part of that, Nicole? Nicole, you probably have to come off mute if you're still on mute. Scott, I'm going to mention another question while we wait for okay. Nicole. Um, you, um, just we had somebody comment about uh, credit card companies potentially lowering their fees. If anyone has um, heard anything about that, I know that's not something we've talked too much about, but. Um, I think if I'm interpreting this correctly, it's the fees that you pay your credit card companies. If um, that has been addressed or if anyone that has contacted their credit card companies to have those fees reduced. It is actually a conversation for everybody to know on a national level that um, I will follow back up with national this afternoon. I'm um, trying to help because not only trying to just battle it at a state level, I think we're trying to, it needs to kind of be at a national level with the credit card companies about either lowering, lowering their fees and their rates um, um, down, you know, much lower where they are. So kind of the same way that National was kind of the driver with Grubhub and some of these delivery services of pushing down. Um, I haven't gotten any feedback yet from National. Um, I know that they are working on it, but I will keep everybody posted on another. Obviously, it's another great question, another, you know, whether trying to lower um, any way that you can to try to um, bring some more money into your pocket. Thanks, Scott. Um, do we have any insight as to um, restaurants selling um, pro produce or grocery items such as milk or bread? And are some of those items, uh, do some of those items require permits like milk? I'm not sure if this might be a Nicole question and if, if she's able to come off mute. I'll I'll turn it over to Nicole. Nicole, are you still there? My guess is Nicole might be on a. Uh, typically, she kind of cuts off because she might be actually on the phone with someone at the governor's office. She just texted me. So, um, I would say you know please send, send us. I don't have initial questions or answers to that. I know I saw a couple of those specifically to me. Um, obviously, checking with what your permits are very similar to the DCP with the alcohol. Um, of being able to change. I know some of you guys uh, have that capability already. If you do um, within your permitting, yes, but I believe that you do need to have specific permits um, on how what products you can sell if you're selling certain things that are outside of the norm of prepared food. So um, I will try to get some answers to you guys on that question because I know we've, we've gotten others to that of selling milk, eggs, stuff directly from the farms um, to take home, putting in coolers, things like that. So let me see if uh, we can get some answers to you guys following this call. Thank you, Scott. Um, and I have another, there's or quite a few questions on unemployment. So if you, um, maybe Ryan can address some of these. Um, so in regards to the, um, I think a lot of it is around timing of should, you know, is it recommended that restaurants continue to lay off employees, um, hold off on laying off employees in regards to the, um, April 2nd FMLA date. Uh, so if I know that's a really broad question, but maybe Ryan, if you can address a lot of the questions that we're getting as far as the timing of laying off staff. Sure. Um, you know, uh, if they're not an employee uh, when this goes into effect, 
they're not covered by the law. The law is specifically addresses employees. Um, so if they're laid off, fired, let go, whatever it is, they're they're no longer classified as an employee. Uh, so these won't apply to them. And you know, unfortunately, that sends the message of you're better off laying people off than keeping them on and letting them qualify for this paid leave because it's going to stick you with the tab. Um, if the government had thought it through and they had funded it up front, I think a lot of people would still be employed. But unfortunately, they took that option away and employers have to respond. And I'm not really sure how there's any other way to respond in the current circumstances than to increase layoffs by April 2nd. Thank you, Ryan. Um, in regards to, and again, this may be another Nicole question, but in regards to um, liquor license renewal, so is there any update as far as the state deferring liquor license renewals for those who have temporarily ceased operation? I can answer it. I think, uh, again, another another question that on the liquor licensing and permitting stuff, which is agency driven, <clears throat> that is a question that I know Nicole unfortunately had to hop off. I don't know if she's back or not, but I will say that we are trying to, it's a great question. It's one that I would, rec you know, that we're trying to get an answer to, to defer, you know, renewals, your cost to renewal, what you do, how can you defer that? So that is agency based, which I feel like they should be able to work with us in this process. Um, um, as opposed to obviously, as you guys can understand, sometimes the state, you know, has to work with outside private entities to try to push back deferment of costs, but this being an agency um, and DCP and liquor control of, of your permit, um, so we're, we'll continue to stay on that. I, I can't stress enough to everyone here on the call. Um, we're trying to get to, we, we think we know all of your concerns or all of your vendors or all your costs or things that are coming up or things that can help you. That's why it's so important for you guys to send us notes, go on our Facebook group, um, shoot us text calls, whatever that it might be, because you know we're getting a lot of these. I think the credit card one was one I got a couple of days ago. We brought up to national um, to someone said, hey, my liquor, license permit you know is coming up I gotta I gotta pay to renew that um, can I defer that uh, whatever that it might be um, the same way with this milk question which I believe you do need a separate permit but we'll try to get clarity on that that's really what we're here for we're trying to be that resource but you guys can definitely help us the more um, questions you ask whether it's right now or beyond that we can hopefully take it to to the proper authorities to try to get an answer for you thank you um in regards to the, I know you spoke about the grants and we had a lot of questions around that and what, what is our level of urgency as a CRA? And I think now that you shared that letter, um, we can see where that urgency is. Um, is there, so a couple of questions around here, as far as grants, um, is there any insight as to how those might be allocated is the first question. And then um, the, the grant, the, the alert that we'll be sending out to send to the governor is that shareable through our social media and otherwise? And can people sign that that are not restaurant owners or employees? Uh, I'll take the latter question first. Um, I would say, yes, anybody can sign the petition. It doesn't have to be a restaurateur the same way. Like they need to understand whether they're an employee, because obviously it affects the employees, whether they're a family member, whatever, same way as the other action alert. Um, anybody can sign that petition. Um, I would ask ask you to share every way in any which way you can with that petition as well. I'm not saying the national one's not as important if you haven't already started sharing it, which I know a lot of your, the restaurants that are on the call have done that. I'm hoping for the same thing with our state specific ask in this letter and this petition. So really focusing on that today and tomorrow, because especially today, if over the next you know 10 hours, the more that we can get, because obviously the the governor and David Lehman at the DCD, they're looking at <clears throat> what these grants are going to look like or loans or whatever they're going to try to roll out. Um, they're trying to announce something as early as tomorrow. We don't know if it'll be tomorrow or not. Um, and then to your former question about what, how this process, what it's going to look like, those are questions we don't know the answer to yet. Um, even on the stimulus from federal to what uh, the governor and David Lehman has said that they are working um, hard and, and, and working very um, diligently trying to get us information of how that process is going to work. As soon as we know, uh, we're going to get it out to you guys if it's a sign-up process, if it's a website. I think that's why I also say it's it's invaluable for you guys to continue to stay in the loop with us 
because you know it's the same way with the SBA loans. As soon as that thing becomes available, we want you guys to be able to apply if it's an application process or how else they're going to look to do it. So um, we don't know those answers. We're hoping to get them here later later today. Um, probably not going to get them probably till tomorrow from the state and then obviously federal as well. But um, I think just trying to answer your question, we know that they're going to do. I guess the last thing I'll leave, leave with that is. I do think that the federal and I do think the state is going to do something. What they do, I think it still um, remains to be seen. And that's why the pressure that we as an association and as restaurants can put on them is so important. And, and nothing against these other small businesses and nothing against these other industries, but we need to be the loudest voice that we can. Um, and we're trying to do that. You guys have done an amazing job of that already, but <clears throat> this petition is a perfect example. If you can get over 10,000 people to sign it, we're trying to work with the news crews and media to talk about. I mean, the current story was was great today. Amazing to have it at front line with with pictures of what restaurants are doing. We can't we can't get lost in in the mix of all these other businesses that are going to start asking for support um, through this crisis. Like we we were the first to ask to say it again. We're the first to ask to shut down. We should be the first in line to get support. But we need that voice to be loud and clear over the next you know 24 hours, and that's really where that petition starts. Thank you, Scott. So um, we're going to do one last question. I know there was a lot of questions just just came in in the last few minutes as we started um, talking through some of this Q&A. So we'll just try to get, I know a lot of them were answered by Ryan or Wise in the comments or Nicole in the comments, um, but we'll try to get as many of those out to you guys. And we will be sharing this video uh, or the link to this through our info sites that we shared with you earlier so that will be on our website and then as well as on our social media our facebook um, info site which is uh, ct restaurants collaborative on facebook groups so we'll be sharing this there as well as um, responses to some of these other questions that we weren't able to get to um, and then just a moment we also will be sharing um, contact information if you guys have additional questions after this call uh, but last question, we had a lot of um, a lot of questions that just came in right at the end about GoFundMe pages, and we're seeing a lot of this, and we understand it's everybody's trying to help in different ways. Um, um, but there are some questions around GoFundMe and how funds are being used, and maybe some questions around that. Um, and then also we have in, in in that same regard, is there anything that the CRA is able to help? with as far as generating funds that can come back to either restaurants or um, or their employees. So Scott, if you can just address that, kind of your thoughts on these GoFundMe pages sure. and then what can CRA do to help? Well, I mean, it kind of goes back to, you know, the, the headline story in the current of what you guys are already doing and giving back. Um, I've seen just amazing stories and please share them with us too so we can continue to share them with media. Um, you know, there's a couple of different things that are going on, obviously, I know you guys care deeply about your employees and are looking for creative ways. You know, I got off a couple of calls where, you know, a lot of a lot of the restaurants are selling uh, gift cards and putting it into a fund for their employees. Um, I've seen, you know, there's there's food for the front lines, which is down in Fairfield County. Stephanie um, Webster and Nicole Leitner down there uh, with with uh, that program, which we're trying to expand around the around the state, which is they're they're raising money through a GoFundMe page to give $15 per meal and they're trying to feed frontline workers uh, from EMTs to firefighters, police officers, medical professionals um, inside the hospital. So that program has already taken off and a lot of restaurants down in Fairfield County led by Bill Tavey, Matt Storch and others um, are doing an amazing job and want to continue to tell that story, but I know they want to expand that across the state. So connect with us. <clears throat> Food Share has been, you know, um, talking to us a lot. I will say if you go on our link, if you have perishable goods um, <clears throat> that you don't think you're going to use, please use our link and send a note to food share. They will actually come to your restaurant and pick it up to kind of bring it to some of these soup kitchens and some of these other areas for people in need that need that perishable goods. I know obviously it's not a revenue generator for you, but it is something where if those food, that food was to go bad, we do ask that you, re, you reach out to food share um, and, they, and they will do most of the legwork and the heavy lifting for you to, to, to get it to the need, the needs um, of the people. Um, also, uh, there's, you know, there's, there's so many different programs, um, feeding hung, I think it's, uh, feeding, feeding hunger us. There's, there's everything else I keep getting. Um, I was just on the call with, with Luke Bronin yesterday, um, trying to do some things in Hartford, but so you guys know at the CRA, the other angle that my staff is working diligently hard on, we do have a 501 C3, um, Connecticut hospitality educational foundation. Unfortunately, the, the original charter was driven on workforce development and education. 
um, not so much in a crisis. So <clears throat> we are actually working right now to update our charter, update our board, and start to receive. We, we've been asked by a lot of companies to start asking if they could give money to helping, and, and we're looking for ways to help support um, our employees, um, our industry in different ways, and everything else through our foundation. So I'm hoping as early as early this week, uh, we, will, we will have that all finished up on a 501c3 standpoint and start asking for people to support it, whether it's you know through smaller donations, whether it's through corporate donations, um, <clears throat> Hartford Foundation for Public Giving, and then obviously working with the board on how we allocate those funds uh, for people that need hardship and need, need support through these tough times. So um, you know that, that's another part of us as an association that we're trying to do. So um, I, I welcome any any other ideas or things you guys are doing across the state. I, I can't I can't be more proud of this industry or what you guys are trying to to weather this storm um, together. But <clears throat> please let us know so we can continue to help in any way that we can. Scott, I just want to mention in regards to that. Um, if we can get this up and running, um, we may have an ask, or would there be an ask that would go out from the CRA to all of our member based restaurants in Connecticut? asking uh, each of you to reach out to your vendors and asking them to contribute to our um, our foundation if that becomes possible. I know we have had some, uh, heard of some large distributors that are willing to make significant donations. So is that something that we would be able to communicate when that's, it, when and yeah. if that becomes available? Yeah, as soon as we get this thing up and running and done, um, which, you know, need to try to do here shortly. Um, and I know Jennifer Conklin Schmidt on our team, our educational manager that runs our foundation is, um, has done a, a great job of, of doing all the things on the back end to be able to allow us to be that pass through. Um, I mean, even talking about, you know, I was talking with Hartford about community kitchens and ways to possibly bring some of the employees back to work to cook for, for the needy um, and things like that. So uh, yes, uh, we, we will definitely, and let's say there's a big ask, but at least promoting it and helping us. I know you guys, individually are worried about you know your own your own restaurant your own staff and hopefully we can find ways to raise money to help them individually but as a whole um you know we we are trying to do everything that we can and we'll take ideas resources but yeah as soon as we get that foundation up and running it'll go out to all of you guys for for help and support thank you scott so again as i mentioned we've got we got to as many questions as we as we could on this call um we're going to be sharing this the link to this call email and on our info site so please access it there and any other resources or questions will attempt to get um, answered there as well so um, Jennifer has just changed this so you that, that you can all see our contacts um, you can see the gray staff as well as Nicole and Ryan thank you both for being on the call today if there are just general questions you can always send to our general email which is info at ctrestaurant.org but please reference this page that has contacts for all of our CRA staff, as well as Nicole Griffin and Ryan O'Donnell. So I thank everybody for being here today and we appreciate all the hard work that you're doing. Um, we'll continue to communicate information out as soon as possible, but we are counting on your feedback and your ideas. So please share that as, as you can um, through our various channels. So thank you everyone for being here today and uh, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thank you. Thanks for that.